Marco and I are pleased to share our thoughts with you today about an important methodological development for project management scholars and practitioners. For many years, when reporting prediction for our research, we have focused on reporting the R-square metric, along with the F-test for statistical significance and the sizes and the signs of the coefficients. These metrics were calculated from the entire data set and were used to predict the data for the dependent variables that had already been used to obtain an optimal statistical solution for your statistical models. Solving the statistical model using the same sample of data to both predict the relationships between the variables and, at the same time, to predict the same sample data is referred to as in-sample prediction. Relying on these metrics has helped us to understand and explain relationships between the variables in our theoretical models. But looking forward as a discipline, we need to move beyond the traditional metrics for assessing prediction. The emerging metrics focus on what is known as out-of-sample prediction. As we point out in our article, to obtain out-of-sample prediction metrics, researchers need to use an initial sample to estimate the model parameters and then use those parameters to predict the values of the dependent variables in a second sample identified typically as a holdout sample. The process of using one sample to develop model parameters and then predicting the dependent variable data in a second sample is referred to as out-of-sample prediction. We hope you will watch the rest of our presentation, which provides an overview of these concepts, and then read the entire article to obtain the full details of this exciting new development in the field of project management research. Well, to set the stage for this study, consider this young man here, which you probably won't know. Well, this is Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley was an English astronomer, geophysicist, mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist. And Edmund Halley had many accomplishments in his life. For example, he recorded the transit of Mercury across the Sun. He also used his observations to expand contemporary star maps, and he aided in observationally proving Isaac Newton's laws of motion. Well, he used these laws of motion to compute the periodicity also of a specific continent, which he documented in his well-known synopsis of the astronomy of comets. Well, you see a little excerpt of this, um, this book, and you see many mathematical calculations here, but there's one striking element in here. Yeah, so on page 22, he says, Hence, I dare venture to foretell that it will return again in the year 1758. So he actually predicted the return of a specific comment in 1758, which he actually did not live to see. And while his computations were no doubt impressive, it was actually the verifiability, and years later, the precision of his prediction concerning this comet's return that made a lasting impression on people's minds. So you might guess what I'm getting at. Well, here's the picture of the last appearance of Halley's Comet in our solar system in 1986. So while the causal explanation delivered by Halley offered a gradual understanding of the phenomenon, well, it's potentially constrained by the capacity or biases of his uh, computations or even the overconfidence of the human mind. In the worst case, a widely accepted explanation, there were actually many of these back then, could be wrong. It's actually the predictive accuracy which offers a clear standard according to which the quality of our explanations can be judged. Obviously, this is not only relevant when talking about comets, planets and stars, but also in other fields of scientific inquiry. It's nicely expressed here by this quote by the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard P. Feynman, who once remarked, 
can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. But yet, its unmatched predictive accuracy actually helped to spark the semiconductor revolution. Well, of course, the notion that prediction is highly relevant also holds for the social sciences. And this is nicely expressed here in this quote by Abraham Kaplan in his famous The Conduct of Inquiry. Here he says, it remains true that if we can predict successfully on the basis of a certain explanation, we have a good reason and perhaps the best sort of reason for accepting the explanation. So to summarize, prediction is highly relevant. However, if you take a closer look how the social sciences actually deal with prediction, a bit of a different picture impression emerges. This is nicely expressed here in this um, article by Hoffman and colleagues, uh, published 2017 in Science. They talk about prediction and explanation in social systems, and they distinguish the way social sciences deal with explanation and prediction from the way physicists, for example, or like the hard sciences in general, um, deal with these topics. So here they say the idea of a prediction-driven explanation is uncontroversial in the physical sciences, but in social sciences it looks a bit different. We generally de-emphasize the importance of prediction relative to explanation. And to quote, rather than asking whether a given theory can predict some outcome of interest, the accepted practice in social science instead asks whether a particular coefficient in an idealized model a slight critique here, is statistically significant and in the direction predicted by the theory. I think everyone can connect to this. If you take a look at like the general way we actually deal with models, how we estimate and evaluate the accuracy, this is certainly true. So what we typically do is this. We have a set of hypotheses which actually uh, define a certain model which is of interest to us. We then gather data and estimate this model using the entire data at hand. When it comes to regression type analysis, we then look into statistics like the um, F statistic to assess like the overall model fit or we look into the R square as an indication of the model's explanatory power. And then we look into the statistical significance of the betas and in their relevance, meaning we look at their size and check whether they are actually in the direction predicted by the theory. So what we do here is actually to follow an explanation paradigm. What does that mean? Now it's illustrated here. Let's say we have some sample data, we have some predictors and some outcomes, and let's just say we have five observations, just for illustration purposes. So we would then estimate a model like this one shown on this slide. This could be a structure equation model or a simple regression model. It could be an ANOVA, you name it. Well, we estimate the parameters. In the case of the structure equation model, these could be indicator weights, indicator loadings, and the betas, meaning the path coefficient. And using these, we get the estimated outcomes. We get these estimated outcomes for the entire data set, meaning in our case, our five observations, because this is actually what we used as input. And with this input, we can then compare the estimated outcomes with the actual true outcomes, you know, with the y. And these are the estimated residuals. Using these estimated residuals, we can then express a model's explanatory power, like the r square, the effect size f square, and so on. Even moving beyond regression, this is common practice, like structure equation modeling, Covariance-based structure equation modeling researchers typically rely on chi-square-based statistics to assess the overall model fit, and they are also being computed based on the entire data set, in our case, for example, our five observations. However, if you actually look how researchers frame their hypotheses and how they frame their managerial implications, a bit of a different picture emerges. This is an excerpt from a recently published article from the Project Management Journal. And seriously, nothing is wrong with this. It's not uncommon. It's just some example that we can use to illustrate this point. So in this article here, the authors um, derive a set of hypotheses. And there's, for example, one hypothesis here. 
uh, when teams undertake simple projects, the constraining factor model, which is like a model that they test, is a better predictor of project performance than the so-called multiplicative factor model. In the discussion of their results, when they talk about their managerial implications, they note that in complex projects, the greatest improvements in project performance can be achieved by increasing motivation. In addition to its own positive effect, this will amplify, amplify the effects of ability and opportunity. So when you actually closely read this here, you will notice that these are actually predictive statements. So in the hypothesis, the authors actually talk about prediction. It's a better predictor of project performance. In the discussion of the managerial implications, they actually also engage in predictive statements in that they actually foreshadow a certain event. This will happen if companies do this and that. This activity will amplify the effects of ability and opportunity will amplify. So this is a predictive statement. It foreshadows what will happen if the company does something. But yet the way these authors and like all other authors basically conduct the analysis is purely based on explanation. Meaning they take the entire data set and estimate the, uh, the uh, model, the parameters based on this data set and then they try to predict the same observations that they have just used to estimate the model. Well, we would also refer to this as prediction, but this is a special type of prediction. This is the so-called in-sample prediction. And to better differentiate that from the actual prediction, we would also refer to this in-sample prediction as simply explanation. So unless you haven't engaged in some type of so-called out of sample prediction or simple predictive analysis, well, then you must not actually make such statements because these statements actually imply that your findings will hold in a different scenario. Using some other data, a company that has implemented these things will do that in the future and you expect based on their situation that a certain outcome will be realized. This, however, is actually not supported by the analysis. To engage in prediction, we actually need to separate the data set into a training sample and a holdout sample. The holdout sample can also be referred to as the testing sample or here the testing data. So coming back to our initial example, we would not estimate the model based on our five observations, but we would simply take three observations out. So let's say the first three observations. This is now our training data. Using these training data as input, we would estimate the model and get our estimated parameters, like the weights, the loadings, and the path coefficients. We would then take these estimated parameters and combine them with the predictor data in our testing, our holdout sample. By combining these, we can actually generate predictions, predicted outcomes here, for the outcome variables y. The important point here is that these two observations for which we engage actually in prediction, for which we actually compute these predicted outcomes, were not part of the model estimation. They were taken out. But the nice thing is we actually know the true values of these outcome variables. We know, for example, that for the fourth observation and the first y variable, the true value is a 5. We also know that for the same observation, the second y value is a 4. But these were actually not used in the estimation process. Well, now we can simply compute the divergence between what we predict and the true values, and these are the prediction errors. We can express these prediction errors now using different types of metrics, like the RMSE, which is the standard metric for expressing prediction errors, or the MAR, MA, MAP, or the Q-square, and there are many other ones. But the central point here is that we need to separate our data set into a training data set and a testing or holdout data set. So where does this holdout data come from? Well, you can collect it using 
a different sampling approach, yeah, a different point in time, maybe from a different company, or you can collect a big data set and just separate, say, 20 to 30 percent of the observation and define these observations as a holdout sample. A common way to engage in predictive model evaluation is using some type of cross validation. In cross validation, the data set is being grouped into so called folds. These folds are simply subgroups of data. And uh, if you say we extract 10 folds, meaning you, um, you classify the data into 10 groups, you would then take one group out, use the remaining, say, nine groups to estimate the model, and then use these parameters and these predictions to predict the left out group, the first fold. In the second round, the second group, the second fold is taken out, and so on and so on. Yeah, so this is repeated 10 times until each group is taken out. The standard approach in uh, data science, and it's readily implemented in practically all statistical programs that you can use. The question now rises, how do we do better? Let's try to summarize what we believe is the direction forward for project management researchers. Number one, we need to focus more on predictive model evaluation. We need to move beyond the R-squared metric, which currently provides in-sample prediction to out-of-sample prediction using other metrics. Number two, as we move forward, we also need to more carefully distinguish between explanation and prediction. Both of these metrics are important, but we need to begin reporting a more accurate prediction metric, one that truly assesses our ability to infer from our sample data to the population of interest in our research. Number three, we need to apply methods that bridge the apparent dichotomy between explanation and prediction. A good way to do that is to move beyond relying on multiple regression to structural equation modeling, and particularly to partial least squares structural equation modeling. We appreciate your listening to our presentation and I hope you have learned some valuable insights about predicting with your theoretical and statistical models. Again, we hope you will refer to our full article as well as others in the Project Management Journal in your journey forward.